Hi everyone, welcome to season two, episode 10 of Morning Matcha. It's our last episode of the season, and I'm here today with Hans Kirsted, who has quite the resume. He is a neuroscientist, a stem cell researcher, an entrepreneur, and he is running for Congress in California's 48th district, which was just declared the district that was most likely to flip. Well, thank you for joining us today on Morning Matcha. Good morning. (laughs) Um, I started Morning Matcha. So we have a magazine called The Fullest. Mm -hmm. And we say we bridge the gap between wellness and contemporary culture. And we're defining wellness as the intention behind everything that you do. And we believe that it goes into everything like holistic politics and being an informed citizen. And um, once... The whole election happened. I wanted an outlet for to personally be more involved and ask questions about social and political issues and also interview people about wellness and just all sorts of topics. Very good. And um, environment, everything. So I'm really excited to have this episode. This is the last episode of our second season. So it's exciting to meet you and I'm super interested in what you're doing and I'm Thank excited you. to get into all of it. Yeah, I'm excited to be here. Yeah. So um, tell us a little bit about your background with stem cell research and neuroscience and everything. I'd love to hear sure. about. Yeah. So I'm a neuroscientist by trade, mm-hmm. a 15 year tenured professor of neuroscience at UCI here locally. It's just been a, a wonderful, wonderful time built a center there, founded the Suenville Gross Stem Cell Research Center, and ran a beautiful laboratory, some 45, 48 people, um, NIH funding, and California Institute of Regenerative Medicine funding, industry funding, donations, and the like. And in so doing, I was a member of a lot of the national institutions that control science, medicine, and healthcare. So gained a tremendous experience with how money is distributed for science and medicine, and then how it is burgeoning our economy. Mm -hmm. So the other part of my career is that I'm a serial entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. So I have built and sold three successful biotechnology companies, and I'm on my fourth. And through that experience, I have learned, you know, the trials and tribulations, the victories of corporate development. So lobbying, regulations, big pharma, Mm -hmm. going to the FDA time and time again, and seeing both the benefits of this wonderful regulatory system we have, but also the pitfalls and shortcomings. So between those two things, university professor and CEO, chief science officer, I've been able to gain a very deep understanding of this nation's healthcare issues. I've worked on spinal cord injury, generated a treatment for spinal cord injury that I'm very, very proud of, very happy for the patients. I generated a treatment for modulating the immune system that's being used in rheumatoid arthritis and ulcerative colitis in late stages. Wow. And then over the last decade, a treatment for cancer. So it's been a fun, fun (laughs) career. So why is stem stem cell research so controversial and what policy, current policies or the policies that could be put in place for the um, current presidential or presidency? um, How does that affect stem cell research going forward? Your question's a great one. Stem cells evoke visceral feelings. Do they come from aborted fetuses? Are they ethically procured? Are they procured with the modern methods of making a stem cell from skin? So your question's a great one. Being a pioneer in this field, I can say that most of the controversy is over. This state of California supported Proposition 71, which specifically funded stem cell research here in the state, Mm -hmm. providing $3 billion for it. We had a very uneducated populace that, after a campaign of education, voted in mass to support stem cell research. And then that went nationally. President Obama, on his first day of office, reversed the prohibitions that President Bush had put on the field, opening up this nation to be the leader in the world in stem cell research. What made you excited about possibly running for, or yeah, running for Congress? And did you always think that you'd have something to do with politics? 
You know, I didn't, I admit. I've always been somewhat of a politico, watching, you know, the, the nations of Canada, England, and the United States where I've lived. And American politics is just fascinating. This balance, or the balance that should be there between mm. the Senate and the House. And when, when Obama was in office, you know, I really saw the nation starting on a, a strong course. Mm -hmm. We had more people covered in health care than at any other time in the nation's history in 2016. Mm -hmm. It wasn't perfect by any means. It was that program was instituted in a in a manner that could have been a lot better. Yeah. And it was maintained in a manner that could have been so much better. But it was a good start. Mm -hmm. When Trump took office, I saw the denigration of this sector and then accompanying that denigration of women's issues, the balance in our culture of fairness to the poor and the disenfranchised, et cetera, the ill. And I needed to take a stand. And then when I realized in, while investigating it, that there is no one in the House of Representatives with a deep, broad understanding of health care, I thought to myself, you know, I can really do something there. Mm -hmm. And I don't like to do small things. I like to do, yeah. <laughs> do big things, you know, spinal cord injury, cancer, yeah. the country uh, fits. So I saw a, a need that it so happens my career seems perfectly preparing me for. Mm-hmm. So that was the second reason. And I think the third reason was the lack of attention here at the district. Mm -hmm. So we've had a congressman who's been largely vacant. And I mean that, both vacant and absent. I don't think that we've had the attention that, we've, that we deserve here in this beautiful, beautiful state. A state that is clean, can be cleaner. A state that we need to protect in the economy that it is burgeoning. Like, for example, you know, clean energy. Mm -hmm. This is just a bastion of leadership here. And yet it's being denigrated. And that affects everything from schooling to health to jobs. Yeah. So when did you decide all that? And did you obviously, I'm assuming, spoke with your family? How was that conversation? You know, every day I, I reported to, a, to several people that were recruiting me to several people that I had approached with interest and to my wife mm -hmm. <laughs> with my meter. Mm -hmm. And it started out at about 20%. And I said, I do it when I was a hundred percent. And I took about four months to get up to a hundred percent. I really needed to know that I could be effective. Yeah. I really needed to know that my profile was one that could win. Mm -hmm. So I did a lot of work looking at the polls, looking at the other excellent candidates in this district and really coming to grips with what I needed to do in order to get there, to get a win. This, you see, this district is very unique right now. We've got a constituency that is moving more centrist from the right. Mm -hmm. So the Republican population here is becoming more and more centrist. It used to be Rohrbacher, right. Mm -hmm. But now it is very, very centrist. I'd say still fiscally conservative on the whole, amongst the Republicans, mm -hmm. but very, very socially responsible. We have a very unique brand of Republicans here. And I don't think it's enough to say, I'm a business person, therefore I can appeal to Republicans. You know, any business person worth their weight in salt <laughs> will tell you that seven out of 10 businesses fail. Yeah. So if you are new to me and you say, trust me, I'm a business person, my, my response is, well, seven out of 10 chances are that you're not a very good business person. <laughs> so uh, we needed something more to appeal to that Republican base because we do not have enough Democrats here. Hillary won this district because she pulled about 10% of the Republican vote. We need to do that again or we will lose. Mm -hmm. So I decided that I could win this. And that's when my needle went from 50 to a hundred. When I started talking to Republicans and friends of mine, you mm -hmm. know, I've run successful businesses. I've done very well. And in talking to them, I realized 
they don't really care if you're a business person because some do okay, some do terribly, some few do well. What they care about is tuning an, an extraordinarily inefficient system. I too feel that the healthcare system it has been unattended to for a very, very long time. And what's happening now under President Trump is devastating. Mm -hmm. It's making it worse. And I think everyone can see that. So when I pop into Congress and I first tune that system in order to drive efficiencies into it, if you're a Republican, you can say, look, we decreased the cost of health care without raising taxes, perhaps lowering them. If you're a Democrat, you can say, look, we decreased the cost of health care and thereby allowed 7 million more people to afford health care. You know, it's a right. It's not a privilege. We need to take care of every American here. And I, I am confident that I can do that. So that's why I'm running for Congress. That's why I'm interested as well, because my father is, he votes Republican, mm -hmm. but he's not socially conservative, but he is fiscally. And so that's why I was super curious because someone like him, who's really interested in, um, in your campaign and mm -hmm. what you're doing, I, I was like, what is it about Hans that sets him apart from everyone else? Yeah, we, we align your father mm -hmm. and I, mm -hmm. most Republicans <laughs> yeah. I'm aligning with yeah. on driving efficiencies both in the healthcare system so that we can have social programs that we can all feel good about mm -hmm. that, that we're aligned on driving efficiencies into the economy so that business people like your father, like myself can grow bigger businesses. And what do we do when our businesses become profitable? We hire more people. Yeah. We pay people more. I have always defaulted being a Dem towards giving my employees the best health care, the biggest savings plans that I can match and the like. But most companies that are struggling, most companies are struggling at some point or another, just like mine have, they, they trim those things. If we can stimulate the business development in this area, in all sectors, not just health care, then we're actually providing a social service. Mm -hmm. You know, if you don't have a job, you're not thinking about President Trump. And if you don't have a job, you're not thinking about health care. You're thinking about putting food on the table and keeping the roof over your head. First and foremost, we've got to allow the working class, the poor, to get jobs. And I realize there, that there are abusers of the system and we need to regulate and make sure that that's tightened and protected. But having grown up, in a working class family, you know, I came to this country poor and as an immigrant and I did well. I, I realized my piece of the American dream. Mm -hmm. It's my firm belief. It's my knowledge that all of those people that I grew up with, me, my family, we all wanted jobs. We all wanted to experience what this beautiful country can give. Some of us got it easier than others. Some of us got breaks. Some of us just climbed up that ladder of our own, you know, strength and fortitude and will. However you do it, I want that system to be there. And it just, it's just not fair right now what's happening to that class. And it brings down the poor. It brings down the middle class, which is almost being eliminated in this country. And it also brings down the wealthy. I, I see it as one mission. Mm -hmm. So what happens when you win? And, um, I'm not familiar with, um, the formality of it all, but you win the, um, yes, I do. Yeah. You're going to win, <laughs> but what happens? Like you choose a topic that you're really passionate about. I mean, you're going to have to weigh in on a lot of things and a lot of issues, but is there one thing that you get to choose that you want to be, um, more focused on? Do they have different, um, like, I don't know. How does it work? Specialties. Yeah, yeah absolutely. This was another reason that I decided to run because I have something that is lacking in Congress. So if you are a lawyer and you want to run for Congress, you can quite effectively and efficiently read the rules and regulations because they're all drafted by lawyers 
and <laughs> slot into that system and, and work it. And we have seen that with the vast majority of congressmen. What Congress needs is field experience. You know, Congressman Lofgren said to me a little while back that, and this, this really stuck with me. If you know what you're talking about, people follow. And I'm so pleased to see that that's the case in the house as it is in business and life and mm -hmm. social matters. You know, I run a flat hierarchy in my company. The person who knows the most about the subject matter is the boss in the room, not mm -hmm. me. If I'm the CEO, it's whoever knows the most about the topic being discussed. It's the same in the house. Sometimes if you have someone there that knows a whole lot about housing crises and they get up on the floor and they start speaking 435 congressmen, perhaps 434 are saying, wow, I don't really know, know a whole lot about that, but she sure does. And so I'm going to pay attention to that and follow it. Healthcare is brutally complex. It involves both the developmental aspects, the regulatory aspects, big pharma, small companies, as well as 25% of our growth of the nation, one fifth of the economy, no small thing. That's what I've been doing for 30 years. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I tell you, I'm really excited. There are some things that I can do that no one's thinking of, but every time I talk to people about them, they say, wow, let's do that. Or with some of the cognoscenti, I've thought about that, but I have no idea how to do it. Mm -hmm. Some great idea, but can you get all of the CEOs of the big insurance companies, big pharma, or the unions in here to talk and work this problem out? And you know, when you, when you spent your life fighting cancer, spinal cord injury, I'm not about to let, you know, process and decorum keep me away from getting the people in the room and fighting the fight. So yeah. for me, those issues are, are irrelevant. They're tiny. Let's get the people in. Let's get some stuff done. Let's put the issues in front of politics and fix some stuff. That's what attracts me about this position. If I had no particular skill set and I was just ambitious and wanted to help generally, that's good. A lot of our congressmen are like that. But it's better if you have something that no one has, something that you can do better. And I'm not an egotistical person. It just so happens that my career has put me in a place where I've experienced all of the national institutions, the private institutions, the public ones, drug development, you know, the lobbying, the the regulations, drug development, and all the evil and all of the good that big pharma offers. So I can relate to the scientist on the, at the bench and I can relate to the CEO running the $330 billion company, mm -hmm. but I will always lead with, uh, you know, that sense of compassion that we need to have to get healthcare for all, to get jobs to the working class, and drive some strength into this thing. I was recently at a hearing here in Orange County on homelessness mm -hmm. and um, they were talking about how, although we're one of the wealthiest counties, we haven't spent much money at all on the homeless crisis. There's actually been a 10 year plan um, that hasn't even been like 10 years ago. They put together a 10 year plan that mm -hmm. they've been having hearings on and it hasn't even started. And it includes affordable housing. But then at the same time, there's the current homeless crisis where people are already homeless. And then there are the people that are about to be homeless because they're one paycheck away from that. So I'm really curious on your take. And yeah. Yeah. You know, we should all be concerned about this. It's, it's not just an economic duress that puts people on the street. It's a mental one as well. Mm -hmm. The majority of people living on the street have mental disorders of one sort or another that are clinical. They're not subclinical, they're clinical. People that have schizophrenia, or multiple personality disorders, autism, the, the gamut. A lot of Alzheimer's, as a matter of fact. And 
you know, we need the social systems in order to pick those people up because in many cases, they're not able to do it themselves. You're not talking about a population that's taking advantage of something. You're not talking about a population who just feels like hanging out rather mm -hmm. than working and contributing to society. You're talking about a population in the majority that need help. Mm -hmm. They are people who have fallen through the crack somehow, whatever put them there. There are also people who have just developed an illness. And yes, there are some that are just down and out and have had bad luck. And there are also some who are floating, no doubt. Don't want to work, you know, drug abusers and the like. There's certainly that mix. So we all have to understand that that population is very, very diverse and it's not going to be fixed with one single thing. Mm -hmm. So it's a larger problem. It requires health initiatives. It requires housing initiatives and feeding those people. So shelter and food being the you know, the first and foremost, because it gives us stability and then medical attention can then be brought into those people in a regular manner. And this is, you know, it's one of the reasons why I was really attracted to uh, your dad, mm -hmm. to Mark Orgel, you know, two individuals in this community who are addressing the problem head on mm -hmm. in a very multifaceted way. And, you know, when we met, there was no discussion about whether we were Democrats or Republicans. Yeah. There was none. I was surprised to find out your father was Republican afterwards. Mm -hmm. it, it's a, just another example of how we should be putting issues and the needs of people and community above our own decisions. Do you know, it is something of a privilege to call yourself a Republican. It's something of a privilege to call yourself a Democrat. You do so from a seat of comfort. Not everybody has that. Yeah. Yeah, it's not about what side it's about working together and um and the more we think about it that way the easier it's going to be to move forward and yeah um but i think some people just feel so righteous in their decisions and it's hard to move um new move past that yeah i think people can get comfortable in their their little bubble mm -hmm. and the society that we live in the district that we live in it's such a beautiful place and it's I can see that it's easy to stop thinking about people in other areas, even close to us. Costa Mesa is a little lower in its, you know, socioeconomic mm -hmm. makeup. And there's a lot of people there that need help. There's a lot of little clinics there that do not in any way, shape or form provide services like Hogue Hospital. Mm -hmm. You know, we've got a diversity here we need to attend to. Yeah. It's nice that we're so close to the ocean because whether you're Republican or not, you see how important it is, how climate change is mm -hmm. a topic to um, not deny. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and I see that that's one thing that my friends, whether they're Republican or Democrat, that's one thing that we agree on. And I'm curious about um your policies on that and how yeah. get it going into Congress, the deniers. You know, I am the guy who walks the beach two to three times a week and my pockets are always full of garbage at the end. Mm -hmm. I'm the paddle boarder who's gotten really good at not falling off his paddle <laughs> board because I'm picking up trash out of the ocean. <laughs> so for, you know, I, I live it all the time in my own life. You know, moving into politics, one sees the larger pictures of denigration of protective policies federally and state and um, the absence of attention and collusion of the worst sorts with government and big, big companies, the, the mining, the coal companies. You know, President Trump, in his first week of office, removed federal restrictions that prohibited coal and mining companies from polluting rivers and streams. His administration removed prohibitions that, um, from the federal level that prevented the uh, um, allocation of public lands for mining. So now these big companies can go lobby a small, little, rather poor, very underpopulated area in the middle of nowhere and start polluting. Yes, they're generating uh, industry there, but there's also no repercussions for polluting. 
And in fact, we have seen the protection of polluters. So, you know, the Environmental Protection Agency was stripped of its ability to even look at the finances of new mining companies to see if they had cash reserves for cleanup, which used to be required. You can't just mine and then leave and leave yeah. all of your pollution behind and destruction of the environment. Well, now you can. Why though? Why would he, why would someone want to do that? Like what's the benefit to him or his presidency? Is it just to create industry? It's very short term. Mm -hmm. Create industry. Look at what I did. Look at how many jobs there are. Is that what it's about? You know, we have seen a serial connection between super big corporations and President Trump. We have seen relaxation of restrictions that prevented larger corporations from doing what they want to do. We've seen uh, proposal of tax cuts in those places. We've seen removal of restrictions for polluting, for expanding industry, etc. So yes, one could say that that's all under the pretense of generating more industry. But I would challenge that there, one, there needs to be fairness. So if you are removing restrictions as a way of, or deregulating as a way of burgeoning industry, well, then you should do it across the board and allow a benefits to go to small companies and midsize, not just large companies. And, and also, we need to see... Uh, the safety put first, both the environment as well as people. You know, the latest, most shocking revelation of the Trump administration and big corporations was the Tom Marino uh, laws that were passed through Congress that relax the DEA's ability, I'm sorry, prohibited the DEA from actually monitoring the production and distribution of opioids in this country. That very same person was then offered, after the passage of that um, policy, a job running the DEA. So the very individual who strips the ability of the DEA to do its job, mm -hmm. Trump then offers that individual a job. And we are seeing 60-some thousand deaths due to the production of opioids with pill factories. Just the production of it? Yeah. We've wow. a massive influx of opiates in this country because it's been deregulated and we are seeing tremendous amounts of addiction because it's a, here. Yeah. It's, and right here in our here. district. Yeah. And we are seeing a growth of distributors that have no accountability and therefore we see massive amounts of opiates on the black market. So pill factories, straw distributors, black market addiction death. This is the result of policies that are not fair. It's the result of policies that are biased towards big pharma. We need somebody in Congress who can stop that. If I was in Congress when that, that bill was being passed, I would be the one saying, wait a minute, you're stripping the DEA of, of this. We're going to see deaths. We're going to see an increase in heroin addiction once people get off opioids, they need something else. Mm -hmm. We're going to start to see a burgeoning of black market industries. And we have. Was it collusion? Was it ignorance? Was it a manifestation of just poor, poor sight? In any case, we need somebody there that knows what they're talking about that can defend people. Uh, but how will that be to stand up for that? I mean, how are you going to get? It's going to be fun. Yeah. <laughs> 434 <laughs> people to listen it's to you. It's going to be fun. It's going to be hard work. But, you know, I, I generated a treatment for spinal cord injury a decade ago with my colleagues. And we just saw Chris Boson, 22-year-old, paralyzed, no motor, no sensory from the neck down, regain use of his arms. And he's, he's petting his dog and he's brushing his teeth. He's hugging. And, you know, I think of that and the successes that we've been able to generate, you know, ignoring cynicism, just walking yeah. a different path. Mm -hmm. 
And I wake up every single day thinking, you know, I, I did that because I, I did something different. I didn't follow a path that everyone was following. When I started spinal cord injury research, 20 years of research had not yielded any treatments. So I realized I needed to do something different. And yes, it was hard. And yes, there was bureaucracy, more so than you can imagine. Honestly, no less than in Congress. Yes, that's a hard system too, but I will never, ever be fearful of taking on a big task. So how's it going to be? It's going to be great. <laughs> yes, it'll be hard. And it'll be long. There'll be challenges. But honestly, when you're on a mission and you, you can put that mission first ahead of your job title, you know, ahead of politics, ahead of who's funding your campaign, mm-hmm. that becomes fun. You can keep your eye on the mission. Speaking of who's funding your campaign, um, the NRA, Mm -hmm. and I'm just curious about your uh, views on gun control. Yeah. I know that. I don't think I'm going to be getting any money from the NRA. Not you, no, (laughs) but I mean, exactly. So our current, the incumbent has, and I know that um, a lot of people in this district or, I don't. I think it's interesting. I wonder what you think about the people that live here and their views on it, and um, yeah. how they'll relate to you on that. Uh, I'm amazed that the system of getting a gun is, is so relaxed in this country. It is unbelievably relaxed, and the NRA has sponsored lobbyists to prohibit the entire industry and the populace from doing anything that challenges this extraordinarily relaxed system of regulation, saying that it, it's a protection against freedom. But, you know, when you get a, a license for a car, it is your freedom to drive. Mm-hmm. It is the ultimate show of freedom to be able to have such mobility. And even at a young age of 16, when you get your license, mm-hmm. but you've got to pass a test. And when you get older, you have to pass a test again more frequently. Mm-hmm. Why are we not regulating the gun industry in a sensible way that still allows all the beauty of sport, et cetera, with those weapons, but are that, that is safe for the public? So I believe that we need to fight the NRA to increase our restrictions. We need to fund the Center for Disease Control in order to study the issue so that we can get statistics because we are currently prevented from doing so. We can't even study it. I'm a scientist. Mm -hmm. We must be able to say who's getting killed by whom, who's buying the guns, how are they purchased, the um, documentation of straw purchasers going across borders from unrelaxed gun purchasing areas to more uh, to different areas and, and distributing guns. You know, an, an example has not been discussed. You know, one of the greatest victims of gun violence is women. Women have a five times, it's a 500% greater likelihood of being killed if there's a gun in the house, if domestic violence is, is a factor, if they have a boyfriend in their past or a husband that doesn't like them anymore, Mm -hmm. And one of the two of them, not necessarily the guy, even the woman, if they have a gun, if there's just a gun in that household in either possession, that woman has a five times greater likelihood of being killed than the man. We have to regulate um, the, the gun allocations to individuals, not only the mentally unstable, but people with criminal records, people with restraining orders on them. Mm -hmm. should have temporary prohibition until that restraining order is lifted. Why are we able to sell in this country kits to render a semi-automatic into a fully automatic? Who needs that? It's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I've, I've never been a gross admirer of the, of weapons in the home. You know, I don't have one, never plan to have one. I, I just don't see the point in it. 
there for me a gun is cool like watching a a movie but that's about as close as I ever want to get to it mm-hmm. <laughs> how e- do you know how simple it is right now in our district to get um get your hands on a gun yeah i actually went to uh, oh. a a shop in our district just to see mm-hmm. and it was as simple as handing a credit card over and wow. i could have walked out with a gun we need to be <sighs> boosting the uh national instant background checks Mm -hmm. so that wherever you go if you're purchasing a gun there is a system there to to instantly check background checks we need to you know regulate access in every way shape or form in order to decrease guns in the hands of the incompetent and how much they're purchasing right like how many and what exactly you know it's absurd you know little story someone's standing at a in a shop and says, can I have some Sudafed? And the pharmacist says, I'm sorry, I can only give you one package. They could say, but can I take five of those rifles? And there's, so there's no restriction at all. Wow. It's, a, it's absurd. So what are you most excited about when you win? Like, what is the first thing you're going to do? I think I'm going to throw a great big party. Because I better go to that. I want to be invited. (laughs) Running a campaign is hard. It's a very tough thing. You are uh, working more than you ever have. You are learning about every issue in the world. Personally, I love that. That's really nice. Mm -hmm. And you are putting yourself in situations that are full of very, very diverse people. You know, as an academic, I spent most of my years huddled around people with PhDs and MDs. As a business person, I spent years with, uh, you know, very motivated, driven individuals. Uh, When I'm walking the beach, you see the diversity. When I lived in England, you have multiple languages. So I like the diversity, Mm -hmm. but wow, there is such a diversity of individuals that you're talking to. And you realize that you can't change people's minds on core, core beliefs. Some people think that having an assault weapon is cool and they want one in their house. I think it's ridiculous, but I'm not going to change that person by telling them that I think it's ridiculous. Yeah. So that's an instance where one must surrender oneself to their viewpoints and consider it and then come up with middle grounds that work. And this idea of working across an aisle comes naturally to me. You know, if you, if you're working on some big issue like cancer, you grow up, you spend every single day reaching across the aisle. If you were a cancer researcher and you beat me to a cure for cancer, I'd be buying the champagne, Mm -hmm. right? (laughs) It's bigger than me. It's bigger than you. It's bigger than my job. It's more important than my paycheck, my ability to afford a big house or a small house. It's bigger than competition. So I, I work with people of like direct competitors in my field every day and we help each other because cancer is bigger than us. We need that kind of mentality when you can speak to someone that says an assault rifle is awesome. And I think it's a ridiculous thing to have in your home under your bed you need to be able to talk to that person and say, why, why is it so awesome? And how can we come to a middle ground? Because person who believes an assault rifle is an amazing thing to have. You also respect the fact that they can kill and hundreds of people and cause grievous harm. Don't you? Mm -hmm. Most of them say, yeah, I do. But you need to, you need to get in the room with those people. You know, I've sold to big pharma. I also know that big pharma's drug pricing policies are sometimes just nothing short of evil. But we need to have the conversation. So we need somebody who can approach these problems as an issue and not a political quagmire. Let's talk. Let's find some middle ground. I need to represent the people of my district. Mm-hmm. And so I need to be on the ground, feel what that is, what am I representing, and then take that on a national stage and open up that discourse, 
find what works. And what do you want to see from the people of your district? I would like to see, you know, uh, a joy that they've finally got a congressman that shows up and answers mm -hmm. their phone calls and emails. Yeah. <laughs> um, I would like to see them engaged and stepping up and informing and becoming less politically partisan mm -hmm. and more issues driven. I would like to see them re-enter the political debates with enthusiasm, not demise, destruction. People are growing so tired of saying, what, we're, we're repealing health care without putting a solution in for political gain? We're putting some tax reform in that has no benefit. It's actually going to increase our debt ceiling just because President Trump said that we were going to do something to live up to something on a campaign trail. Mm -hmm. I'd rather see that individual live up to the contributions in a moral sense, not a political one. Mm -hmm. So I would like to see the people in this district um, grow untired, start to be more enthused again, that they can actually affect change and they don't have a government that's stopping them from doing so. Well, thank you so much for joining us. I'm so excited and I, I just want to help as best as I can. And You are. Um, yeah, we can't wait. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for stepping up and doing everything you're doing. Seriously, it's great. Thank you.